continuing our studies of the end times. And every so often I like to go back into this particular subject because it's always a subject that is of interest. It's always a subject where, if you like, the world has moved on a bit since the last time we spoke. So I, I taught on Revelation uh, three years ago. I've taught Revelation several times. Uh, but I'm, I'm making it slightly wider, this subject. This is the end times, and so you've got Daniel, you've got Zach Zachariah, uh, you've got the Gospels, you've got Paul's writings, in addition to what's going on in Revelation. I'm just going to pull them all together under this general subject of the end times. Before I do, let me just open in prayer. Father, I want to say thank you for uh, the pleasure of coming together and eating solid food. Lord, sometimes we have to really uh, have a capacity to eat beyond uh, light stuff. And Father, we know that your word, uh, other than faith, this is the subject that, that is, a, is a consistent thing all the way through the New Testament and many places in the Old. So Father, give us the capacity to understand and to understand the times. And Lord, as your word says, not to go beyond that which is written. But we thank you that there's a lot been written. So help us today to tease it out. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Wonderful. So this can be a little bit heavy, and, and uh, I, I don't want it to be, but the subject itself is weighty. And so we have to make sure that we have balance, that we understand it. There are different views, there are different understandings as well. I will teach from my perspective on this, but, that, yeah, but I will also point out that there are other times when other things and other ways of looking at it. Um, because there isn't a, a subject in the Bible that is more divisive amongst churches than the end times. There are churches in this town who don't believe certain aspects that you're going to hear today. There are other churches that, that are fully committed to various aspects because it's all to do with interpretation. And actually, one day we'll all know. And one day we'll all find out. Uh, and so we plough. So I'm going to teach a particular uh, slant on particular scriptures, but that you need to know that there are other ways of looking at it. And I'll do my best to perhaps present some of those. You don't often hear end times teaching from the pulpit, and you don't often hear end times uh, teaching and preaching in any other format. Certain churches will tend to go that way, but generally it's not, it's not heard or spoken about in any particular way. There tends to be some congregational members who have an interest, but actual end times preaching is a rare thing. Why is that, do you think? Why is that? That's a very good point. It's a long time coming. And yes, I would say it is still a long time coming, although it is nearer than, than when we first began. Mm. You see what I'm saying? And so, um, uh, through history, they've always thought it's coming, but they're not sure when, and, and so th there's been a, a waiting. So you're right, Sidji, that's, that's a very good point. Why? Give me another reason why it's not often spoken about in churches or preached from the pulpit. Because uh, some people um, are afraid to Thank you. drive the congregation away. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Some of the subject matter is a bit scary. It isn't, you know, uh, wonderful stuff when you start talking about the judgments of God. So it can be a bit scary, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. And so you'll often find that people will read every other book, but they won't read the end book. Won't go near it, won't touch it, won't touch it. You know? and, it's, and, and, and I'm saying other books as well, but Revelation is the book, and it's written in a very, um, if you like, pictorial language. So if you've got an imagination, you know, when you start hearing about the dragon, and when you start hearing about, um, uh, you know, some of the imagery that comes in, Seven beasts and bits and pieces. But because it's scary, we've got to learn it. We've got to know it. And I'll, you know, anything else at all? Any, any other? Did you, you say that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say this. It's also complicated. You know, the gospel is a, is, is a straight thing to study and a straight thing to understand. And you believe it or you don't. 
But there are, with the end times teachings, it is a complicated because you take a bit from this part of the scripture, you take a bit from that part of the scripture, and it's like a, it's like a, well, in my previous church, we used to have uh, ladies that used to make those big quilts. And they used to knit one with a bit of fabric here and a bit of fabric there. And I think sometimes this teaching is a bit of fabric here and a bit of fabric there. It is all sewn together to make one great big picture. And so it's, a, it's you know, along those things. Also, as I've already mentioned, it's contentious. It is a, a, scriptures that are very open to interpretation. Why? Because they're prophetic. And prophecy, you know, requires, uh, we, we, we understand in part. We don't understand the full picture because uh, God is speaking through somebody. So, you know, like when we have dreams and visions, you don't understand fully. It's in part because it's coming through a human body. It's going through a human mind. And again, we've got, we've got that to, to deal with. The problem is this, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, in the New Testament, all talk about the end time. They are all hit the subject straight on. Um, and obviously, Matthew, Mark, Luke is Jesus talking about the end times. And let me go first of all to what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I probably won't be able to finish this subject, but we're going to talk about the bit of contention, which is commonly known as the rapture. The rapture. Now what I'm doing is I'm picking subjects and I'm going to link them all together. So uh, last week we spoke about uh, the second coming of Christ, and I just touched on that. All that was was an introduction. I'm going to talk about the rapture tonight, uh, and then I'm going to sew up all the gaps between the two uh, and put it together as, as, as one thing. So we learned last week, didn't we, um, that Jesus has a job description. And in, and, in, and in Luke 4, Jesus comes, remember, he does, he's been on this earth for 30 years, he's, he's there, and the Holy Spirit comes on him after baptism, and the first thing he does is he enters the synagogue, he takes the scroll, and he reads from Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, etc., etc., those wonderful those verses. But we learned last week that he stops at a certain line which is a quote from Isaiah 61. And, and, he, and he stops, what, can anybody remember the line he stops at? Uh, it's, that's the following line, you're right, you're absolutely right. But he says, this is the year of the Lord's favour, or the year of Jubilee. Do you remember? And we looked at the year of Jubilee being the time when um, uh, uh, people are returned to their rightful place, if you like. Property is returned to its rightful place. Land returns to its rightful place. In other words, things go back to the owner. And what he was saying when Jesus, he finishes on that line, he's saying, I, I've come back to restore you uh, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to bring you back to correct ownership. The one who's going to buy you with his blood. The one who's going to purchase you, Jesus Christ. And so he stops at that line because that is the job description of Jesus Christ. This is Jubilee year. It's always Jubilee year with, with Jesus. Hallelujah. But then you go back to Isaiah 61 and you find the line that he stops at, which is then the day of vengeance for our Lord. So when Jesus first comes, it is Jubilee year, but there will be a day of vengeance for our Lord, where that passage, that prophetic word moves on, and that's the day of the second coming. That's the day when Jesus returns to this earth, not as a saviour, but as a judge. In his eyes, all the way through scripture, he weeps when he sees Lazarus' tomb. He, he, he looks with compassion on the lost. Um, who are, you know, without a shepherd. It's, 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 it's such a, uh, his eyes are, the, the, are ones that completely show his emotion and his love and his mercy to people. That's the first thing. But when he returns, his eyes are not going to be like the eyes of compassion. His eyes are not going to be the eyes that weep over the lost. His eyes are going to be the eyes of a judge where you and I dare look in them. Where you want to cry and say, mountains cover me. It's a different, if you like, sign of Jesus. We know him as saviour, and I pray every one of us know him as saviour. Do not come to know him as judge. I cry out to people that they would know the Lord as saviour before you meet him as Lord. 
Because when you meet him as Lord, if you don't know him as Saviour, it's too late. It's too late. And so there are two sides to our Lord, and we, we enjoy one side, but there is another side. And we have to make sure that we're aware of the seriousness of it. And what it does for us is it drives people to evangelize. It drives people to tell people about Jesus Christ, that there is a judgment to avoid and a saviour to embrace. And so that's what, what we, we were learning last week, that, that um, there is a day of vengeance. And Jesus' is first coming, and Jesus' is second coming, there's a period of time. And you and I live in that period of time. That's the one. It's, and it's, it's known as an age. Um, an, e, an aeon is in, in, in Scripture. It's an age. But that age will one day end. It will run out. All right. Now, we also look generally at how do we know when the, the time is running out. And there is a seven-year period where we know exactly... Really, what's going to go on in that seven Can anyone remember what that period of time is called? What's the general name of it? Tribulation. The tribulation. Now, I'm going to give you many other names for that term. But it's the tribulation. So we know that before Jesus returns to this earth, there will be a period of seven years, of which three and a half years will be bad, and the following three and a half years will be the worst that this, that this world has ever experienced. And we're going to look at some of the judgments again. We're going to look at some of the things that come to this earth. Um, water will dry up. Food will, will become scarce. Um, there will be diseases. There will be, there will be horrors of war. And, 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 and the weather will all be, uh, at some point, all doing the same thing at the same time. I pray that none of us experience it. It will be as nothing that's been experienced before on this earth. There will be a man who will rise up, and this, this man, uh, you've heard me preach this several times now, this man will accept what Jesus refused. So when Satan offered Jesus all the, all the kingdoms of the world, if he will bow down and worship him, and Jesus rebuked him, a man would accept him. And this man has a name generally. What's his, what's his general name? Antichrist. Antichrist. Now, we, he won't be called the Antichrist, but he is the Antichrist. And so this man will accept what Satan offers him and he will be given extraordinary powers and extraordinary abilities and he will rule this world on behalf of Satan. And we'll talk about this at some point. He will have a capacity, he will be charismatic, he will be a leader that people want to follow. Because he'll be able to speak to the Muslims, he'll be able to speak to the Jews, he'll be able to speak to the Hindus, the billions that I've just spoken about there, and pull them all together into one world government. I find it interesting, you know, that in Scripture, America isn't mentioned at all. And I wonder whether, whether you know, America will have anything really to do in the end times. It doesn't appear in any of the, any sort of the stuff. But other countries do. Russia does. China does. The Middle East does. And Israel is central to it all. So this, this Antichrist, he will be somebody of great charismatic abilities. I believe he will use the, the um, social media because it talks about in Scripture there where you'll be able to communicate with the world. And we see it now, don't we, where news can travel within seconds around everywhere and you can see imagery and you can so there will be it may be somebody that has the capacity to control media and again we, we, we'll look at these sort of things but this is the timing seven years and eventually this all gets up and there'll be one aspect also that there will be a false prophet that stands next to the antichrist you see if you want to control people you need to control what they believe and even if people are communists, they believe in something. And so the false prophet will be, if you like, the PR man for the Antichrist. And there will be a one world religion as well as a one world order. Be listening for this stuff when you hear it in the news, when stuff's starting to come together. Uh, and you'll see it. We're, we're a way off yet. But these are the sort of things that you're going to be starting to look at. So that's what we were talking about last week, weren't we? The, the coming of Christ, and uh, uh, sorry, the second coming of Christ, and uh, 
what that may look like and we will visit this. I've just painted a very, very big picture. When I get a flight, a local flight, I fly often, um, you know, two, three, four hour flights or whatever, I, you, you can always choose your seats. And I tend to, because I have a bit of leg room issues, I always get an aisle seat, and I always tend to try and get, if it's available, a seat by the emergency exit. Not because I care about the emergency exit, I've got life insurance, spiritually, I don't care about it. <laughs> but I like, I like, I like the leg room. And I also, at times, like to get into conversations about people who flock to the emergency exit. Now there will be, with what we're about to talk about, in my view, an emergency exit. An emergency exit for people not to go through the tribulation. And I'm going to talk today about the, the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Before those seven years come, before they enter into all those difficulties, there is an exit. And uh, we're going to look at this particular passage of scripture that talk about this. Before it crashes, there's an emergency exit for God's people. And let me see if we can do it. It's called the rapture, but you'll say, well, I don't see the word rapture in Scripture. It's not there. Well, it depends what Bible you've got. If you can read Latin, and you've got a Latin translation of the, of the, of the Bible, you will find the word rapture. Because the word uh, rapture basically means to be called out, to be taken out. It literally means uh, to be snatched away, to be caught up. And let's, uh, let's see where that word rapture in the Latin um, appears in a Greek version. So let's read really 1 Thessalonians. And can somebody read chapter 4 and read verses 15 to 18 for us, please? 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes there, uh, chapter 4, verses 15 to 18, please. What we are teaching you now is the lost teaching. Yes. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. Yes. There will be the shout of command, the archangels, the archangel voice, yes. the sound of God's trumpet, yes. and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Yes. Then we who are living at, the time, at that time will be gathered up along yes. with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. Thank you. Thank you. So that word rapture, in the Greek, you'll find it um, in verse 17. Okay, so, then, he, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. There it is, that's that word. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So that word there, caught up, is the Latin word for rapture. All right, and so anybody that wants to argue, and this is one of the arguments that some traditional churches and ministers in this town will argue with me quite easily on this one. They will say, but it doesn't appear. But it does appear, it's just the translation that's different. All right, and so... That word rapture is that word caught up. And we see that word for rapture being used in other places in the Bible. Can anybody think of a New Testament story where a man was in a place and then he ended up somewhere else very quickly? Was walking along the in, in Old Testament, yes. Yeah, that's what, yes, exactly. New Testament, New Testament, New Testament I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, now, Stephen, I thought about Stephen. Uh, I'm thinking of somebody else in that Philip. time scale. Philip. 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 And so it's, it's, it's a word that's, that comes up in, 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 in Scripture. And this is one of the arguments. There are some churches that think that the rapture will take place, but it will take place right at the end of the tribulation. And that the church will go through those seven years, and then just before Jesus returns, they'll go up in lift and then come back down with him. 
Can't quite work that out, but they, they base it on the scripture, he who endures to the end will be saved. Uh, I can see that point, but it's not a strong argument. There are others who think that, and that what they would say is, I am mid-trip. When you hear the term mid-trip, that means that after three and a half years, that they, that, so they do partially the tribulation before it gets worse, and then mid the way through, then the Lord raptures them um, with this particular scripture. Now I can see that argument because it talks about a trumpet. And if you look where the scriptures are on trumpet, you are middle of the way through the judgments at that particular point. But I think trumpets appear other times as well. And so the Lord uses a trumpet to declare his presence, to declare this, and there are judgment trumpets, and I think this isn't one of them. But again, that will be an argument. What we've got to be careful of is that we don't start identifying. I'm mid-trip, I'm, I'm post-trip, and my theology on this would be I'm pre-trip. Pre the tribulation. And I'm going to give you the reasons for it. But I'm making you aware that there are others who don't believe that, who have a different view, and will argue quite easily through Scripture, different ways and different versions. That's fine. If we get it wrong, we can all rejoice in heaven. Amen. Perfect. We can all rejoice in heaven. Um, it's not a salvation issue. All right? It is an interpretation issue. But I believe with all my heart, and for the reasons I'm about to give, that God will take his church out of the way before the judgments start to fall. Now, that scripture is interesting because it says that Jesus returns and we, the church, will join him in the air. You see, I spoke about Jesus' second coming, and I'm going to look at his feet when he comes back. I'm going to study his feet, because his feet are going to go somewhere. His feet are going to land on something. And if we, want, if we read Zechariah, it will tell us that's coming up. But that particular passage in Thessalonians is nothing to do with Jesus' feet touching the ground. We meet him in the air. And so this, if you like, is between the first coming and the second coming, and this is another event where we join him okay, in his feet and there's a reason why his feet don't touch at this particular point we'll touch on that at some other time I think pre-tribulation rapture of the church there is biblical Old Testament models for that can anybody think of some judgments that came on the earth in the Old Testament where people were removed before the judgment fell. Sigi? Um, Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is the prime one. And we've mentioned that last week. It's the prime one. All right, so Noah is building an ark and he's saying basically, repent, get in the <coughs> ark. Judgment is coming. The rain starts to fall, you know, and I should imagine there's a level of ridicule at that stage. Then it says that God shuts the door. And at that point, it's too late. The floods come, the earth is wiped out, but those who are in the ark are safe. And so there was a period of time, there was a, there was a, uh, a time scale, but in the end, uh, the righteous family of Noah were removed from the righteous judgment of God and kept safe. And there's a whole script preach on there with the atonement and the pitch and all that. I've preached on that before when we're talking. But Sigi, did you have your hand up? You have to shout it to the other bit. The thing that I was going to say wasn't that. Like, I was thinking of something. You're thinking of what? You weren't thinking of Noah's Ark then? I was thinking of something else afterwards, but it wasn't that. Was well, okay, okay. Well, you got, it right. you got the answer right whether you know it or not. That's fine. That's fine. Can anybody else think of another occasion? To film? Lot's family. Okay, so Lot has made the stupid uh, decision of staying very close and actually living inside um, Sod Sod one of Sodom or Gomorrah. I can't remember which one it is now. I think it's Sodom. And so he's in, he's in the city. The angel come down and we get the dialogue, don't we, with Abraham and, uh, you know, um, how many are going to saved and this, that, and the other. How many are righteous? I will look at this, that, and the other. Then the angels come to Lot and basically said, until you get out, we're going to hold judgment off. But run for it, basically. 
So we know the story, out comes Lot, out comes his family, but his wife drags her feet. Her heart, you see, her heart is, you know, is still, still in, in, the, in the city there. She looks back, she turns to Saul. But the pattern is escape. The pattern is time is coming, judgment is coming, but you, my people, you have a time to get out. Or you have a time to be kept in safety. There's one other in the Old Testament that I was thinking about. Yeah. Say again. Oh, yes, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Rahab. So Rahab, Rahab's in the wall of Jericho. God's people are coming through Joshua. Judgment is about to fall on that city. But she's told, stay in the room and put the red cord through outside there, and I, there's a lovely preach on that, the scarlet cord of redemption. And uh, it's a thing that flows all the way through the Old Testament. And when Jericho falls, and it falls out, not in, and archaeologists have found this, that room, which was in the wall, in, a room in the wall of, a, of Jericho, was secure and safe. So they've actually found an area of the wall that didn't collapse. Astonishing, astonishing. But that too is correct. So there's an Old Testament pattern of before God's righteous judgment falls, he removes the righteous from it. So that's a pattern that we're going to see all the way through. So that is, is, is the first one. Um, let me think, what was the next one? Right, okay. Also, the tribulation cannot be described as anything else but the judgment of God. It may have some natural causes involved in it, but it is the judgment of God. And you'll see that through Revelation, how the judgments fall during that time of tribulation. And so if you are a Christian, in the time of the tribulation, you are coming under the judgment of God. Now, you and I are not under the judgment of God. You've been saved. The judgment of, of the Father has come onto the Son. And so if we were going through the tribulation, we're going through another bout of judgment. And God never operates that way. We, don't, we are, we are uh, saved by grace. We're not part of that anymore. And so, again, I find that a strong argument, that we don't come under the judgment of God. Um, we've got this for the Passover. You know, Egypt comes under the judgment of God, but God's people, God's people are safe and secure. I have a question, yeah, please, Alevi. Because when I was in Fidel, this video we watched on Rapture. Yep. And um, the, uh, when the Rapture, when the trumpet sounded, yes. Christians were rapturable. But then there was this pastor. So there is a way. Is it called Left Behind? I can't remember the question. I think it probably is a video. Pastor that his wife was always attacking him and he had been holding it in then one day she served him cockroach for breakfast so the man got angry and that was when the trumpet sounded so the man did not make it so does that mean that so i have that thing in my head yeah i that think one. i know the video i think it's part of the left behind series which was a very powerful series uh, made for american television basically and i think there are certain accuracies in it uh, and I think I remember the, the, the minister with an empty church sitting sitting by his, yes. by the platform there, and he has it. He said, "Although I preached it well, okay, there is there are several conditions for not making, <coughs> not making heaven. Uh, one of them, obviously, is that you are actually not a believer, okay. and there will be people and there will be preachers who are not saved. They can preach it, but unless you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you are not saved." And there are fake preachers, and there are, there are fake ministers, um, and it's a big, big subject, big, big subject. Another one is that if there is unforgiveness in your heart. I was looking even this week, at, uh, today actually, at, at, you know, who else won't make heaven? It says, all cowards, liars, those who practice um, sorcery, adulterers, adulterers. Will not, will not enter the kingdom of God. Now there is repentance. 
for somebody who's in sorcery. There's repentance for somebody who's been in adultery. There's repentance, and it's not, and we're not talking someone who's you just lie because it suddenly clicked in. We're, we are sinful people in bodies of flesh, and things pop out. But you and I both know perhaps people who are just they just open their mouth and lie. You know, and if they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and yet there's no change in the fruit of their lives, they're not going to make heaven. It bothers me some scriptures that you know you have heard speak on this. You know where the Lord says that you can drive out demons in my name, you can heal in my name, and yet I never know you. I never knew you. There are going to be people on a day of judgment who are going to be absolutely devastated by by what the Lord is going to say. It doesn't work out that you preach well. It doesn't that you've even seen signs and wonders in your life. That is not the criteria for heaven. The criteria for heaven is, do you know Jesus Christ? Know him. That word in the Greek is genisko. And it means the closest you can get is, is the relationship between a husband and wife. You know each other. You know each other on many, many levels. And that's the way the, the Lord parallels it. Do you know Jesus? Because he's available to know. And what does he say? He says, get behind me. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, it, it, it got on my sight, basically. I never knew you. I never knew you. And so that's the important thing. Not coming, not coming to church, although church is important. Not having a Christian vocabulary, although that vocabulary is important. Not reading the word, although the word is incredibly important. Not praying, although praying is incredibly important. Do you know it? And everything else then follows. So that minister there that, that was there and was, you know, um, there must have been something that they're making a point on. He preached it, but he didn't know who he was preaching about. Now there will be a time after all of this where people can still enter heaven. It's a different, it's a different um, dispensation. It's a different time. There'll be, a, and I'll teach that there'll be a different place around the throne. All right. So people can still get in, and there will be an incredible evangelistic move as it starts to move before Jesus actually finally returns, right up to the point before his feet touch the ground. When his feet touch the ground, it's over. It's over. All well, got hands all over the place now. All right? James. Yeah, um, I was talking, I just want to inquire, or I yes. believe anger again can stop you from getting uh, into God's side. Yes, I mean, he uh, God has uh, observed that with Moses. Moses did not see the promised land. Mm -hmm. All that he did, he was a good man, he did all what yeah. he could do, but he could not see the promised land. And I believe because of anger yes. um, and water at Menba, and also because of anger, it break the ten, um, the ten Commandments. Yes. Yes. Even though the people were trying so but yes. they were always God's people. Yes. So I believe yeah. the anger was another factor as she was saying. Yes. Um the wife was yes, yeah. And that and pastor, so yes. the pastor could yeah. not see. And, and I can see that sin. and uh, there will be a variety of sins that that uh, will but yeah, Moses is in heaven. Um, and the reason we know Moses is in heaven is that he reappears. So his anger didn't stop him from coming into the kingdom of God. Now there's a different side of things because Old Testament and New Testament, things like that. We can touch on this, we can talk. You're right though, but any, any sin that is unrepentant, anything where you are, you are um, if you like, it is beyond the casual. You are, it's, it's, it's got, you've got to deal with this stuff. And if the Holy Spirit says deal with the anger and you're saying no, I'm, uh, basically I'm going, to, I'm going to do what I do. Um, I think there was a danger there. I think there was a real danger there. But we will talk at some point on once saved, always saved, versus loss of salvation. I will teach that you can lose your salvation. I will teach that. Um, for a variety of reasons that I can talk about at, at some other time. If I'm wrong, all I've done is make people uncomfortable because they're saved anyway. But if I'm right... I have stopped people from being deceived by the fact that they think they're okay, but the reality are they're going to come. And I'd rather be, I'd rather be wrong on this earth, but right 
in the kingdom. So even if I preach that wrong, it's got a fail safe in it. But if you preach once saved or always saved and you're wrong, people's eternal salvation is affected. You know. Anyway, it's a big subject. We won't touch on that. I saw some other hands. Sue Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted um, um, a little clarification, uh, so to speak. Um, when you're saved, when yes. you know you accept Christ yes. as your Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. you are saved at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it the same, or would it be different from when, at baptism, yeah. when you ask the question, yeah. um, do you believe in your heart and all? Okay. Is it the same thing? Or uh, no, uh, but ba baptism follows a private decision that you've made with the Lord. So baptism is a public declaration, you hear me use this phrase, public declaration of a personal decision. So when I ask, or somebody else in the baptizing, do you confess that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Saviour? And they say, I do. Then we say, on that public confession, you're now baptised. That's the phraseology we use. You see, uh, the Lord requires us to confess towards people that we know Jesus. That's what baptism is. It's a public thing. You can't be baptised privately. And so it's the next step. But but if they die between receiving Jesus and, and, and they, they're not baptised, they're still saved. Okay? They're still saved. But the next step for us is always baptism. Okay? Yes? Uh, there is an aspect I just want to mention. Yes. Uh, the fearful the fearful will not get to heaven. The what, sorry? The fearful. Fearful, yes, yes. Uh, you know, the reason why I'm saying this is other sins is intentional or yes. unintentional. Yes, yes. But some people, they are fearful, yes. not because they want to be fearful. Yes. So how do we manage that? Right, okay, well, one of the sins that says you, you won't enter the kingdom of God is cowardice, which is linked to fearful. Through fear of man, you say or you do nothing. That's, that's what cowardice is. And so it's as much as but what you don't do as as much as what you do do. Now, any issue that's in our lives, there's grace to overcome it. There is the capacity that the Holy Spirit puts within us to be able to say no to unrighteousness, to sin, but also the strength to overcome traits, things that are in our lives that are big. Fear is one of them. And so, provided, I think, that we are working with the Holy Spirit, who will help us in our weaknesses, we're fine. We are works in progress, all of us our works in progress. I mean, we're talking some of the Old Testament prophets, you know, who took on, who took on uh, Jezebel and then is running to a cave in the next, the next sentence. You've got David, you know, who took on Goliath but ends up running from Saul because he said in his heart, I'm surely going to be died, killed by this guy. Complete nonsense, utter lies. So there is, if you like, grace for us, but there is a higher calling on our lives than any of the Old Testament um, famous people that you can mention. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is within us. Whereas the Holy Spirit was on David and he was on, although David did actually have the Holy Spirit within him uh, under the Old Testament. He lived like a New Testament guy in the Old Testament because God was using him as a, showing him as a, uh, somebody ahead, you know, that he could point to. So David could go in and he ate from the temple illegally and then he could do this stuff. All right, but but generally the Old Testament is the Spirit of God came on people there, but in the New Testament we have the Holy Spirit within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We know these things, and so if you like, we are without excuse, because within us is the capacity to not be fearful, to be bold. We can pray. That within us is the capacity to say no to sin. We, we, nobody can ever say, I can't help it. I can't help it. Because when you receive Jesus, you can help it. All of us can. We've also got a high level of revelation. Because the Lord speaks to us personally. He speaks to us spirit to spirit. We, we've got the full fullness of his word. The Old Testament didn't have that. And so we are, we are if you like, 
expected to live at a higher level than many of the things in the Old Testament that you see. So we've got to work on it. Work on it. But what I say is don't worry about whether you're saved or whether you're not. If you're worried about it, you are saved. <laughs> it's those people who, 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 who don't, it doesn't bother them. It's like, it's like water off duck, the ducks back to them. They're the ones that need to worry because they're, they have got a, a, a hardness or a religious spirit or something like that. If you worry about this stuff and you simply pray, Lord, it's like sometimes, you know, I can, I can preach a salvation message and the same people come past, come through four times to get saved, you know, because they're, they're, they're still in that process. Well, keep coming forward to be saved. Keep coming forward, you know. You're saved for the first time, but you, you just feel, and you come again, and you come, and I know some people, you know, they, they just ran forward on every, on every preach, you know. They were saved, but they're just now working it out. They don't know how to handle it. They don't know quite yet. They don't know the feeling of it yet. So that's where I, we're at with it. But there will be a day where the line is cut off. Yeah. And it worries me, it worries me. And I know that many people have had very, very difficult upbringings. But when I hear, I can't forgive my stepmother. When I hear, I can't forgive my father. When I hear those sort of things, you've got a stronghold. And strongholds have to be brought down. You see, a stronghold is when you know the truth, but you can't obey it. You just can't do it. And, and that's a prayer and a teach for, for another occasion. But those things, I think, are those areas where, which suddenly become great because the scriptures are not great on forgiveness. They're not. And, so, and we have the capacity to be able to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, I'm moving off my subject now. But you see how big this is. This, yes. Yes. Say, yes. I need to ask, um, I've got three, uh, three verses that I need to ask, and I need maybe clarification. Yes. Say, after the rapture, are there going to be, are there going to be some Christians that are going to remain? Right. Because when I look at Ezekiel chapter 9, yep. it talks of the men, of seven men that came up. One yep. had the briefcase with ink. He said, you are saying, let him go forward and yep. put a mark on the yep. people. Yeah. That's number one. Okay. And then the next one is Revelation chapter seven. Yes. It says uh, then the, the four the, 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 it says the, the four angels they were yes. told to hold the wings of the earth until we put a seal yes. on the children yes. of God. That's it. That's it. And then uh, Matthew chapter twenty four must be verse thirty two when it says if this time was not cut short, sure. yes. even the very elect yes. would yes. be affected as well. So after the rapture, will there be other Christians? Yeah, great, great, great question. And the right, and, and with the scriptures, it's right to ask. I will, I will come at it from what, what I feel the right answers are, but you're going to have to weigh these things up. But the church being raptured out of the way, who are they talking about as a result if the church is not there? And I will say this, that the Jewish people have still a significant end times role to, to, to do the Lord. And I believe this, that the Jews become the evangelists for the world. Secondly, there will be people who will be coming to Christ because having seen the disappearance of the church, they will go, hang on, I know, I know what that means. And they'll start looking and they'll start, because the Bible hasn't disappeared, and so they'll start reading and they'll start thinking, are we in the seven years? Is it about to start? And they'll start looking for signs and they'll start looking and, and they'll start to realise what's happening. And they, and they will turn to Christ. So they're going to be saved on this earth. They've missed the rapture and, you, and you'll find that within around the throne room there are various, various dispensations, various people that come in at different times. And so there will, be, there will be a lot of bloodshed during that seven years. And they're going into heaven as well. And, 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 but, but predominantly it is those, the Jewish people, who will start to realise um, you know, who, who the Messiah is. Uh, and there will be a powerful move of God. It will be as the Jews were required, but they didn't get it right. Yeah. But then they're going to move. So those really are those. So there will be salvations after the rapture. There will be, most certainly there will be. And, and I think then God's, God's own Jewish people 
will then fulfill their role as what they were intended at the time. All right. So I'm going to have to move on. I'm really going to have to move on on this, otherwise I'm going to be caught up with it. So bring your questions. We will pick them up. We will pick them up. Now, this to me is the main reason for the rapture. You and I can intercede through prayer. So say for argument, say you're on the earth and you start to see the sicknesses, you start to see the, the, the obvious judgments coming, the suffering, the struggling, which will be off the scale. We've never experienced it. We haven't seen it. We've seen touches of it. We're hearing wars and rumours of wars. We're seeing, you know, uh, lack in certain areas. But this will be on a worldwide scale. Now, when you and I see it, what do we do? We're going to automatically start to pray. We're automatically going to start to, um, intercede. to intercede. We're going to be using the name of Jesus. We're going to be, we're going to be crying. In other words, we are powerful and we hold back, if you like, the work of God because see, we're interceding. And I think the predominant reason that we're the church is removed out of the way is so that we can't intercede and hinder God's judgment. We can't do it. We can't do it. And so that, for me, is, is, is a clear clear thing. Another thing for the, uh, the rapture is that it says here at the end of... Somebody read verse 15 of 1 Thessalonians 4 for us, please. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord mm. shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay, yep. So does it... What's the next one? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with yep. the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and yep. the dead in Christ shall rise first. Yeah. Forgive me. Yeah. Verse 18, please, tomorrow. I've read the wrong one. Verse 18, if you just drop to verse 18. 18. Yeah. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's it. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. If we're going through the tribulation, how will that be a comfort to us? How would, if I was to say, um, Tamara, you and me, we're going to go through seven years. But the end of the book tells us what it is. I tell you, you and I are bursting the tears to go through what's coming on this earth. It is dreadful. It is appalling. It is beyond anything that we can know or imagine. And how we can we couldn't come I can't we can't comfort each other if we're going to be going through it. Comfort us with those comfort each other with these words. And so the comfort is that the judgment is coming, but we're going to be out of the way. Hallelujah. And so, uh, again, that's an argument that I'd like to use. Now, I want to reiterate that there are other, other arguments on this. Other churches will have different views, mid-trib, post-trib, uh, all sorts of various bits and pieces on it. All right? You're just going to have to settle it yourself as to what it is and why it is and all that. I've given my reasons, and these reasons are generally of the theologians that I like to study. But there are other, other ones there. Now I've been using, I use many books and uh, many, many authors, but I'm, uh, one I'm finding very helpful at the moment is a guy called Skip Heisey. Uh, he's on, uh, probably, I've seen him live and bits and pieces, but he's, he's done a very useful little chart that I'm just going to... So the difference between the rapture and the second coming, all right? In the rapture, Jesus returns for his church, but the second coming, Jesus returns with his church. You see the difference? In the rapture, it's heaven to the air. So the air we breathe. It doesn't land, it's air. But in the second coming, it's heaven to the earth. Alright? Okay. With the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride, the church. With his second coming, he returns with his bride. Okay? With the rapture, the focus is Jesus and the church. With the second coming, the focus is Israel and his kingdom. We'll talk about that at some point. This is important. With the rapture, the arrival is sudden, with no signs. With the second coming, it is predictable, with seven years and many signs. With the rapture, 
Only the believers will see Jesus. He comes in a twinkling of an eye. He comes, if you like, like, at night, like a burger. That's what the Bible talks about. But with the second coming, every eye will see. Every eye. So those are the differences, uh, according to that particular pastor in America, you know, which, I, which I find very, very useful. Now, can somebody now read Luke 21, 34 to 36, as I begin to wrap this one up? Luke. Luke 21, 34 to 36, for me. These are other scriptures that relate to this particular subject. 34. Luke 21, verse 34 to 36, please. Be <laughs> your God, don't let yourself become occupied with too much feasting and drinking mm -hmm. and with the worries of this life or yes. that day may suddenly catch you like a trap for it will come upon all people everywhere on earth be mm -hmm. on their lap and pray always that you will have the strength to go safely through all those things that will happen and to stand before the son of man jesus spent those days teaching in the temple and when evening came he would go out and spend the night on the mount of olives mm -hmm. early each morning all the people went to the temple okay. to listen to him. Alright, so verse 36, watch therefore and pray always. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Alright, to escape it, to escape what's coming. That's the important thing. And let's, let's turn again to Mark 13, it's the same passage really, Mark 13, 32 to 37, please. I just want to show you how it appears through the Gospels. Mark 13, 32 to 37. However, no one knows the day or the hour when yep. these things will happen. Yep. Not even the angels of heaven yep. or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will come, yep. be on guard. Yes. Stay alert. Yes. The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. Yes. When he left home, yes. he gave each of his slaves instruction yes. about the work they were to do. Yes. And he told the gatekeeper to watch for yes. his return. Yes. You too must keep watch. For you don't know when the master of the household will return. Yes. In the evening, at midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak. Yes. Don't let him, don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. Yes. I say to you, what I say to everyone, watch for you. Yes, hallelujah. So yeah, verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch, watch. Okay, and so we have to be watching. We don't know when he's coming back. He will come back suddenly. He will come back without warning. He will come back, as I say, in the twinkling of an eye. They say the end of the world, the end of when Jesus returns uh, for his second coming, there will be a lot, and we're going to go through all the, all the signs that you're going to see that's coming. All right? But when he returns for his church, it will come quickly, and it will be a suddenness. Now, where I don't agree with the film Left Behind is that there are things like planes crashing and stuff like that. I believe God is a God of order. And if the, Christ, if the pilot is a Christian, and he's raptured out of the way, he leaves a Boeing 747 flying across the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that, isn't, that isn't my God, you know. Um, so I, I think there'll be ways of, of, of landing planes and all, all that stuff, you know. If you're having a, a, an operation and the surgeon knows Jesus and suddenly they're raptured out of the way and, and, and you're left with one nurse, one nurse, no, no. Now, at the hospital here, you're probably with a whole of the, uh, the operation place, all, all, all have gone, but, you know. God isn't a God of, of chaos. He's a God of order. And so he will make a way. We don't know how he's going to do it. We don't understand what he'll do. But I can't, I don't believe in, no, I believe that they'll be taken out, that there will be cars smashing into cars and, and, and things like that. I don't, I don't see that as, as anything the way God operates. Well, we've got five minutes. So quick questions then, anybody? Quick, quick question. Do you believe that once the person dies, the person is more general control? Yeah. That once a person dies, the person is Jesus has come. So I, I missed it. Once a person dies, yes. 
the person is Jesus has arrived. That's the end for the person. Right? That's the end for the person. So yeah. That means that your own, you have face your own rapture. What's between uh, Yeah. If you so, if you so, the Bible says this. You know, uh, you, you die once and then face judgment. All right. So there's no coming back. When you breathe your last on this earth. There's no, okay, Lord, I, I now believe I want to come back. Um, th that is it. That's your time. Okay, and so that's why it's so important for us to evangelize and to make sure, because people need, need to know the finality of it. And what's happened, particularly in this country, is uh, a sense of everybody goes to heaven. That's the sense. I'm a good person. Or, you know, I've done some good stuff. Or, or... God isn't that, that judgmental that he won't love me. And, but I tell you, God is, God is love, but his judgment is love. He's saying this is the standard. I've, I've made a way for you. Nobody need perish. Nobody need to go to a Christless eternity. I have made a way for you. But I'm not going to push into your life. You've got to invite me into your life. You've got to submit to my will. And lay down your will. That's the choice that you can make. He says, but, but you know, if, if you want to live by your will, I'll comply with that. Until you leave this earth. And then you cannot be in my presence. You cannot be what I've got planned for. You can't enjoy that. You will be in a Christless eternity. You see, at the end of this book in Revelation, it says that the false prophet, the Antichrist, are thrown into the lake of fire. There's no conversation, there's no debate. They are thrown into the lake of fire. Satan joins them after a thousand years. They are thrown into it, he's thrown into a lake of fire. But here's the sad thing. Everybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is also thrown into the lake of fire. And people have trouble with that. Because we grow up in a world of grace and mercy. But I tell you, there's a, there, there is a judgment that comes. And it is final. But here's the good news. As in the beginning of Genesis, when it was the father with his children, at the end of Revelation, it is the father with his children. That's it. Nobody else exists. Just the father with his children. You and I have got to make sure that we take as many into that kingdom as we can so that we all can be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Serious stuff, isn't it? Heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy stuff. But I tell you this, you start talking about end times in your office, you'll get people's attention. Do you know what? Paul taught this to the church of Thessalonica. They were less than a year old. And he'd already taught them. In fact, he writes this letter to them because they are worried because persecution starts. When this church starts, persecution starts. And they are so worried that the persecution that they're feeling is in fact the tribulation. Because they've never experienced it before. It's so awful. And Paul has to write the letter to them and say, no, this isn't the tribulation. You're going through persecution. But what I was talking about is still to come. That's why he writes it. And that's why he says, comfort each other with these words. You've not missed it. <laughs> You've not missed it. And you're going to, you know, Christians will avoid it. So there's a lot here, isn't there? Let me just pray. And... Uh, you can go home and digest this, this heavy word. Father, I want to say thank you for uh, the bread. Lord, this, some, some bread is light, some bread is heavy, some bread sits on us and takes a while to digest. And Lord, but this is, this is important stuff. Paul, you, you told Paul to teach this to a church that was less than a year old. And Father, yet some of us have been in the Lord many, many years and have never heard it once. So, Father, help us to have the seriousness of this message and drive us to evangelism, to be praying and interceding for our family members who don't know you yet. For there will be a day, and it is coming, when there won't be time, there will be no more evangelism. It's just going to be your children and you together. But, Lord, such a loss and such a horrendous pain before we reach that stage. Help us, Lord. Drive us forward. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Help us, Lord. Drive us out before you take us up. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you.